right. So thanks everyone for joining us again um, for our Lunch and Lead series. Uh, it's presented by the uh, Leadership Institute and the Society of Innovators here at PNW. Uh, Lunch and Lead is a free virtual speaker series and it's designed to help community and business leaders develop knowledge and skills which, uh, while raising awareness of best practices from other leaders across uh, Northwest and Indiana and beyond. Such leader today, we're really excited to have joining us is Tim King. And Tim is a former retiree from the um, uh, Louisville Orchestra. He served there as the executive director. Um, after retiring from there, Tim moved to Northwest Indiana and became involved, heavily involved, with the LaPorte County Symphony Orchestra as a volunteer. He was eventually asked to take on the executive director position there, and he served in that role from 2018 to 2023. During this time, um, the LaPorte County Symphony Orchestra doubled their annual budget, tripled the amount of subscriptions, and completed a successful $1.8 million fundraising drive during the 2022 and 2023 season, um, celebrating their 50th anniversary. Um, so we are very excited to have uh, Mr. King here with us today. The chat today will be led by none other than our very own Sheila Brilson <laughs> Matias. Um, <laughs> I, of course, am Makisha Richardson. We're also joined by uh, the Society of Innovators um, Executive Director, Jason Williams. So say hi, Jason. There you go. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Sheila, but I'll mention that um, if you have any questions for Mr. King, Please put them in the chat and Jason and I will make sure that you get those questions answered before the end. Thanks so much. Sheila. Thank you. Thank you, Makisha. Thank you, Jason, for doing all the behind the scenes things. And welcome, 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 Tim King. We are delighted to have a leader with your breadth of experience and um, obviously a lifetime of wisdom, lessons learned. And so we're <laughs> delighted to hear your story today. Uh, you know, just for everyone who's listening, uh, Tim warned us that he's a talker. And I said, perfect. That makes my job really <laughs> Uh, you know, we we do these once a month. We've been doing them for quite a while now, and some conversations are just so um, dynamic and smooth. And so, I'm really looking forward to hearing your perspective. Um, you have lived in Laporte County for um, since 2013, so 11 years, and um, and you live in a rural setting, so that's interesting to uh, to those of us who live in various parts around the region. So we're we're really glad that you're here. Um, Makisha gave a summary of your career. Uh, can you share with us a little bit? Uh, uh, insights into your career and your leadership journey. We're here to talk about innovation, innovative leadership, and they're kind of like two sides of the same coin. So we'd love to hear a little bit about your story and how you uh, how you um, travel through your various chapters of your career and your personal life. Well, the original intent was to become a high school choral director. That was, I went to college to get a, a bachelor of music education degree. Um, and coming out of college, I uh, was from central Kentucky. Mount Sterling actually is the little town I came from with a really dynamic choral music program, believe it or not. And so that's what really got me interested in. Um, so <clears throat> after college, um, uh, I was married uh, to Debbie then and we moved to Louisville. And the only got job I could get was a, a teaching general music K through eight um, at the Catholic school. Um, and so I, I did that. Uh, enjoyed it very, very much, made contacts I still have to this day, believe it or not, sang at several of these kids' weddings, you know, when they grew up. And um, But th that that transformed uh, into a, a, an education director position at the Louisville Orchestra after four years that I applied for um, and received. And so that's kind of where it all started, really. Um, I found out that teaching, believe me, if anyone has never taught, they have no idea of what teachers go through in a classroom, how exhausting it is. It's truly an exhausting profession and an incredibly noble profession. But I didn't think I had the strength to do that anymore with 100 kindergartners and 100 eighth graders, but all in one day, I had to take on several personalities, you know, during the You're day. You're talking to a teacher here, so I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> you get it, don't As soon you? as I started to have my own children, I didn't think teaching was such a great idea. How can I be patient at work and at home? <laughs> Oh, my, 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 my hands go down in adoration to teachers all the time. I'm yes, telling you, I, I really, really mean that for my very soul. Um, 
so this this was a chance for me to be in an administrative position and still be involved in music education at the same time. And things just kind of evolved from there. Um, positions became open. Um, the operations director came open. And, and so the executive director said, let's you take that on. And, and so someone else noticed my work. And, you know, my father taught me a long time ago. He said, just keep your head down and do your work and do the best you can do. And people will notice. And that's really kind of what's happened to me. Um, I've had nine different positions positions either in education or the arts throughout the year I've only interviewed three times I just thought about that the other day I I must be I, I don't know how to interview I guess but people would call and say come help us we're in trouble please help us take this position blah 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 and so I think I was open to trying something new all the time um, and so that really helped um, if, to, to broaden my area. Um, I didn't know a thing about marketing. I didn't know a thing about raising money. I knew about music education, but I was passionate about music education. And so I think those things just kind of happened um, upon themselves and just through the, through the Kentucky Center for the Arts, which was one of the positions I had to the Louisville Orchestra and, um, and various other projects with the Jefferson County Schools. Unlike here, see Louisville only has one school system. Um, they have 110,000 students in their school system. So the, my last position in Louisville was director of performing arts for the school system there. And so I was able to combine all the knowledge I had working with the arts groups um, in Louisville. So everything just kind of built upon itself. Um, and um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a great ride. It really has. That's lovely. Uh, so it sounds to me, you know, we like to say that uh, leaders have to be brave. And it sounds like as you face challenges where you really were clearly in over your head. You didn't know about marketing. You might not know about operations, but you knew music and you had a passion for that. You were able to be brave and not um, be afraid to take on new challenges. So talk to us a little bit about some of the people you you, you said you haven't really interviewed that the jobs kind of came to you and were, yeah. were people encouraged you to. So t talk to us a little bit about some of the people who inspired you, who, who were the, like kind of the wing, the wind under your wings that, um, you know, helped you along the way, because Oftentimes, as we progress in our career, there's an opportunity for us to turn around and, and help the people that are coming up behind us. And right. um, I, I love to hear um, the people who helped you along the way, because I know there had to be some inspirational folks out there. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Well, the very first one, uh, you know, who hasn't been inspired by a teacher? And so that, that would be, his name is John Stegner, who still lives in Lexington, Kentucky, was my choral teacher in high school. And he's the one that noticed that I had some talent. And he said, you need to do this. This is, this is something you need to do. I did not come from a musical family. Nobody in my family even played the comb. I mean, it was no, no one even, did, there was nothing. And so he really instilled that love of music in me and the ability, my, my family thought music was a hobby. That's all that was a hobby. You couldn't possibly yeah. make a living in music. So I really did have to go against my parents' wishes um, to major in music. And it wasn't a happy time there for a little while. And as I tell people after I graduated from college, my parents, all I did was I never came home and asked for money. So they were happy about that. I made my own living. And so they thought, well, he must be doing okay. <laughs> so that, that was the good part. But he was, he was the real motivator for me to get involved in music and open so many doors for me to get scholarships in college. And, and I'm grateful to him to this day. Um, another person was the gentleman who was the president of the Kentucky Center for the Arts back in the late 80s and early 90s. And his name was Marlo Burt. And Marlo came from Minnesota Public Radio, and they had just built a brand new art center in Louisville called the Kentucky Center. And he was the president there for many, many years. And he hired me away from, I was at the Louisville Orchestra for two gigs, and he hired me away from the first gig. And he's the one that taught me about raising money and marketing. But he had this incredible, uh, he knew how to supervise people. And he, he never raised his voice. I never, ever, ever heard him raise his voice once. But when Marlo said, pick up that piece of paper off the floor, you better pick up that piece of paper off the floor. I mean, he just had that authoritative tone to him, but yet he was a nurturer at the same time. And I learned so much from him. I think about how to deal with people uh, to get the most you can or how to supervise staff too, as well. Um, kind of a practice what you preach. 
um, yes. Yes. discipline. Uh, so he was a, he was really, really very uh, instrumental in, in helping my growth during the time that I was in Louisville. Um, and finally, I have to say, um, when I came here, of course, I was retired when, when I moved here. Um, and one of the first people I met here was Lee Morris. And I'm sure everybody knows who Lee is, of course. But um, in my older age, I have found out that he has been a real inspiration to me as well because he turned 89 in December and the man is still sharp as a tack. Mm -hmm. And he proved to me that there's such a thing as lifelong learning. And I have learned so much from him about in, being eager to learn and learn new things and be involved with people and get involved. And uh, another person that's been very helpful to me here was Maria Fruth with the Health Foundation mm -hmm. in Laporte. Um, she, I needed help. Um, desperately with the orchestra when I started, I knew how to fish, but I didn't have a rod and reel or bait. And so <laughs> she helped me fish. Um, and so once she gave me the rod and reel, the healthcare health foundation did, we were able to do so really my whole life, you know, from high school to thirties and forties to even my sixties. Um, I've had people that have been incredibly helpful uh, along the way. That's, that's, those are wonderful. First of all, the people that I know that were on the list are wonderful um, community treasures. They are yeah. um, dynamos, each of them in their own right. But to, how did you get to LaPorte County? We're all from the, across the region. Uh, pretty much everyone on the call is somewhere uh, in the five county area um, or right up into the edge of the um, west eastern suburbs of Chicago. So tell us, how did you, why, why, uh, why LaPorte County? Why the region? Why Indiana? Well, it just sort of happened. Um, my husband and I, uh, he was with the Kentucky Department of Education, and he retired from there as their chief op uh, operations officer and chief legal counsel. And I had retired from the school system. That just, and Louisville gets too hot in the summers. Oh. Just, you might as well be in New Orleans in the summertime. I mean, at, during the summer of 2012, because we moved here in January 13, it was over 90 degrees literally every day between Memorial Day and Labor Day. And we yeah. said, we can't do this. We're going north. And so um, we found- um, <laughs> The last couple of weeks have not been a good-, a good <laughs> But you know, I, I don't mind that. I tell people, you can always put more clothes on. There's only so many clothes you can take off, but you can always put more clothes on. So, and I, and I like, not like other people, I love snow. So everybody thinks I'm crazy, but I- because everybody up here knows how to deal with it. That's the beautiful part. In Louisville, yeah. they don't know how to deal with snow. Up here, yeah. you do. That's and so that was really what spurred it was um, coming up here. We were actually going to be in Southwest Michigan. And then we started looking at homes and we found the dream home. And oh, that's nice. what did it. And the dream home nice. was outside of Rolling Prairie. Wonderful. Well, that's a lovely part of the of the region. It's yeah. just beautiful there. Um, we love it. So, so what motivates you today, Tim? Tell tell us. You know, you you've reflected on some of the chapters in your career. You um, you've talked about uh, the lessons that you learned and how kind of you did a lot of leaps of faith. From what it sounds like, you, yeah, you were like, okay, people think I can do it, so I, like your dad said, put your head down and figure it out. <laughs> But, right. So what motivates you today? You you seem like you have a really large life force. So tell us about what's happening today with your. Well, I'm still involved with the orchestra. Um, the, you know, the, 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 um, as, as a committed volunteer and I will be for the rest of my life. I think we have an, an amazing, an amazing organization here in LaPorte County. And I want people to know that if you've always lived in LaPorte County, you just think that there's always an orchestra there. And that is not the case. Um, uh, populations our size don't can't support an orchestra. They ha cannot support an orchestra. And so for the fact that this one's been here for 50 years and now hopefully is doing better than it ever has, at least on a financial basis, will be there for many more years to come. Um, I'm just committed to that. So we started a, a planned giving um, organization within the orchestra and Lee and I are working on that. So that keeps me pretty busy. And there's a couple other fundraisers that I'm involved with, uh, with the orchestra too. Um, we have eight acres. And so that's going to keep me busy. I felt like the last five years I've kind of dropped the ball um, on the eight acres around here that I love. We've got a lot of flower gardens and woods yeah. and paths, nature paths and stuff. So I'll be really interested in keeping that going. And we've made a ton of friends, a ton of friends. Um, and so as I tell people, I'm a full-blown Hoosier now, even though I don't sound like it, but I'm still a full, I'm a full-blown Hoosier. And and you will carry me out in a pine box out of this house. We just love, love, love this place and where we live. So 
that's what motivates me today. I mean, I, I will tell you, I'm happy to wake up whenever I feel like waking up now. That's nice. Yeah. And yeah. I'm happy to take a nap whenever I feel like taking a nap. That's nice too. So right. I will, right. I won't begrudge that. <laughs> it sounds like you're in a like wonderful that. phase of life. You, uh, you have a great attitude and you have, uh, you know, lots of, lots of things that you have planned. You, you know, you, it sounds like you learned a lot of lessons along the way, you know, for other organizations, whether they're art organizations or other you know, small um, organizations, um, what what could you share with them as far as um, being able to kind of re get yourself out of a rut, rethink your your brand, rethink your organization? What would be some of the kind of um, lessons learned or tips that you would um, you would share with us? Well, first of all, one has to be passionate about their cause. If you if you if you're running an organization and you're not passionate about that organization, you should not be running that organization because passion is contagious mm -hmm. um, and it's contagious I with like funders. That. Funders, if funders know that you're really passionate about what's is that you'll be able to convince them to to help to help your organization. So I think that's number one. You've got to have a what I call the spear carrier. You've got to have a passionate person running that organization. Um, I also, um, I, I don't take no for an answer. Um, I can remember when we started talking about the fundraising here uh, for the 50th anniversary, I had a lot of people say, there is no way in the world you're ever going to raise that kind of money. You're, it's not going to happen. You're not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm sorry, but I think it is going to happen. And, and, and it did happen. Um, and I had a lot of people that came back to me and said, wow, I was wrong. I can't, I can't believe you guys were able to do that. Um, and basically what happened was the people that we asked said, we're happy to ask. No one's ever asked us before, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So it, I really have a problem with, uh, with pessimism, <laughs> I, I'm not a pessimistic, but I think people, people tend to be pessimistic. Um, but passion don't take no for an answer. Um, also I, you, if we, especially with nonprofits, you've got to have a strong board. You really, really need a strong board and your board president needs to be a spear carrier as well for that board. I was fortunate enough to have four individuals who were as passionate as I was and Lee was among them um, about the orchestra going from um, an, or, an organization that a lot of people were thinking, well, we don't know if it's going to make it or not because they had a, you know, a lot of lean years and asking us to get out of the rut and donate and do this. And it was always like a, a Band-Aid sort of situation. And um, and that's the one thing I said when I came in here, I said, this Band-Aid stuff's got to stop. We can't, we, we can't, this has got to stop. And they, and they were like, well, how's it going to stop? And so, you know, we just worked on ways to, to, to make that happen. So um Having a really good board is an involved and passionate, caring board who will roll up their sleeves and do the job that needs to be done. You can have a 10 member board, you can have a 20 member board, but you got to make sure that every board member has a job um, to do and, and keep them involved. Uh, Faye Moore, uh, who is a Michigan City resident, just put a comment and it popped up on my on my uh, chat box. And she said, you know, thank you for saving the the, keep keeping the symphony here and then also that you know sometimes in the re we don't appreciate uh what we have and i have to say this isn't the first time i've seen a, someone who comes from somewhere else that you know we we can whine and complain about it where we live but sometimes a fresh lens from somewhere else comes in and says whoa you have no idea how blessed you are and yes. uh, it you know just that that Switch in perspective is often um, what can spark, and and clearly in your case, you sparked uh, metamorphosis of the of the <laughs> of the um, symphony, and um, well, you know, we're, I, we all benefit from that. I I think because I did have experience in this field and a lot of experience in this field with a much much larger budget, you know, in Louisville mm -hmm. it was like a seven million dollar budget, and Laporte was about a it was struggling to be a $250,000 budget. Now it's more closer to about a half a million now, but yeah. it's all relative. It's all relative about how many people can support um, what's going on, but you're right. And I, and I came in because I saw this struggling orchestra, but yet at the same time, I saw and heard an orchestra that actually played way above their pay grade. 
you know, it's not the Chicago Symphony, and we know that it won't be the Chicago Symphony. And but and, and another thing that really helped our situation was the music director search, which they had not had in over 20 years, a music director search. And so I think that was a real kick in the pants for the musicians too to have a different person in front of them all the time. So everybody was trying to impress each other. Musicians were trying to impress the guest conductor and vice versa. And more people started coming out because they kind of wanted to see this competition going on between these conductors and who was going to get this job. And uh, and so that was a that was a real really good bump for us. And then of course at the end of that the 50th anniversary came and we had some I had some really wonderful board members that said we have to take advantage of this. People like to give to anniversaries. They like to do something special during that time. So this is what we need to do. So it just all kind of kind of, kind of worked out. We just couldn't let that go by. Well, you you uh, actually preempted my my next kind of area of talk. Oh, to sorry. Talk about. <laughs> no, no, no. Perfect. Because you it was a perfect segue. Uh, the the I was going to ask you about building up the culture of an organization. How do you as a as a leader um, build culture? Because, you know, you can have enough money and you can have, you know, the right opportunities. But if you don't have a culture that bonds people together, you know, passion being one of them. But you, you, you kind of gave away maybe part of the answer by saying, you know, people, um, they got a new they got new faces in front of them and they started to bond around competing around impressing around trying new um new strategies and so talk talk to us a little bit about you know as a as a manager of people all leaders have to figure out like what's the each person is unique each person has different challenges and different you know um attributes how do you as the as the leader um you know tweak to build that culture that makes people really care about what what they're doing well a thing like an orchestra it is not a need. I think it's a need, but it's not food or water. Right. And so you have to you have to uh, encourage people to be a part of it because it's not something they have to have. It's something they want to have. Mm-hmm. Um, when I when I came into the organization, um, it became very apparent to me that uh, several sponsors and several individuals had had been not treated very well. And so I went on what I call the apology tour. Um, and I went on an apology tour and I, I did a lot of visits to people, a lot of visits, um, telling them, you know, I don't know what happened before. And I'm, if it happened, I'm really sorry, but this is what we plan to do now. If you'll just stick with us, I know we need to prove it to you. I get it. Um, but here, here's my background, just so you know, I, I know what I'm doing here. If you would just stick with us and do this. Um, I think that helped a lot. It was exhausting to do that. Um, because a lot of people um, were very like, who, who is this guy? You know, what, 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 what do you want? What, what do you want here? And I'm like, I don't want anything. Uh, I want you to stick with us and, and let you know that we're going to improve and things are going to be better. The other thing is, is, is communication, communication. And I'm still a big, big believer in personal communication. Um, I started doing what I called a biweekly newsletter uh, that went to all the subscribers and, and I told them the good, bad, and the ugly. They, they knew it all. And the board knew that I did this. Um, so I just kept a, a, a list of things that were going to happen, things that had happened, uh, things that we would like to see happen, um, good things, bad things. But I think just keeping that communication open um, is, is a big, big deal because then, then they feel that they're a part of it. When we did the music director search, not only did the musicians vote, the entire audience voted. So everybody had a hand in choosing the new music director. Wow. And that's the, and we literally, that's how we did it. Um, and we went through the six candidates. We went through and we, you know, of course, uh, we did everything by the book. And the musicians had questions of things that they needed to fill out. And the, and the audience had things that they needed to fill out. And so whoever scored the highest, between the musicians and the audience is the person who won the title. And that's exactly what happened. Carolyn Watson scored the highest with both the audience and the musicians. And we had another couple of people that came in really, really close, uh, but she was, she was the one. Um, And so we, we feel very fortunate to have her because this is a woman on the move. I mean, this, her trajectory is doing this. Mm -hmm. Um, And so for an organization, the size of LaPorte County, 
symphony orchestra to be able to have a music director of her quality. Um, it's uh, we're not going to keep her forever. And I know we're not going to keep her forever because she's going to go on and do bigger budgets. And, but I'm hoping that she'll know that we gave her the first chance um, and that she'll always be true um, to us. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that whole situation really helped a lot. People felt like they had a hand in choosing who the new person was going to be. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just, a, communication is so, so key. But I also think that, um, you you know, I conversation leaders are brave. And you took, that's, that was kind of risky, to be honest. You know, you didn't know the outcome. And as yeah. leaders, you know, we tend to want to be kind of like, okay, we're in charge. We know what we're doing. Yeah. And you, you actually took all of the, um, you know, everything and gave it to the people. Um, That's right. So, you know, you were taking a, a, a obviously calculated risk, hoping that, the, you know, the cream would indeed rise to the right. top, which it, it did. But well, you did you, take risks. Well, we, we did, but I didn't look at it as a risk because mm -hmm. if, if the musicians, this was the person the musicians wanted, um, then they were going to they were going to do their very, very best for that person. And if this was the same person that the audience wanted, they're going to subscribe. They're going to go to that concert. Yeah. They're going to go to the entire season. I have conductor friends who are so popular that people subscribe because of them. They don't care what's on the program. They just like the conductor. They like his or her personality. They like the music they're going to do. And so they, they're they like, I don't care who it, what they're playing. I'm going to see that person. And so it's it's really very person-driven, especially in the arts. I can see that. Yeah. It's very yeah. it's, it's a personal thing. It's, it comes from the heart. And so it, I didn't really look at that as a, as a brave thing at all. It just... It just worked out really well. <laughs> well, it was, uh, you know, you were honest with people that you w would listen to them and um, you you were very candid about the needs. Yeah. And like, I love yeah. the newsletter idea, you know, where you kind of shared the, what's behind the curtain. Because, right. um, you know, but then people feel like they have, you know, skin in the game. They they get it. They you know, they're more interested in, in what you do. The, um, if you were, if you were coaching, we do, uh, we do in our leadership programs, we do uh, coaching for individuals and um, we try to meet them where they are, but then also provide, you know, some, some, you know, as they share some of their um, challenges, we try to uh, coach them. If you had a, um, a organization, so an arts organization, let's keep it to the arts. How would you, what coaching tips would you give uh, a leader coming up behind you that may not have the depth of uh, experience? And it certainly sounds like you've got psychological experience as well, because you are able to figure out how are people going to going to react to these kinds of things and, yeah. and really, um, you know, invest their passion. Well, again, communication, um, I, I believe with your staff, I'm a big believer in, in hiring people who have, a, who have skill sets that are different than mine. Um, and I have no problem. I think you need to check your ego at the door. If you're a leader, you've got, you know, there's a famous quote that says, I'm a leader, so therefore I must follow them. I mean, that, that, that's, I, I, I kind of believe in that a little bit. Um, you, you just kind of have to check your ego at the door. And, and if people have really good strengths, play on those strengths and let them shine. Let your people shine. It's important to, to let them shine. And if they leave you, they leave you. Um, but they maybe they're going on to do something uh, that they'll be a leader in their own way. And in a sense, you might have had something to do with that. Um, I also I have always tried to, when I work with people, I always ask their opinion. Um, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? I, I never tried to make a decision by myself. And mm -hmm. I think if you can involve your staff in, in decisions that need to be made, um, they will stay a little bit more loyal to you than they would have normally. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, they're not going to stay forever. They get chances and things like that. But I, I'm a, I just think that it's very, very important to involve your staff in most of what happens on a daily basis. I, I love that. Um, I did want to mention your apology tour. I'm going to keep that in the back of my brain. I, that is really, you know, to be able to be so, you know, human and upfront with people and say, you know what, I while I'm not responsible, I know some bad things happened in the past. So you're acknowledging their pain and their discomfort and their yeah. angst. And, and, and their then wounds, you're off, believe me. Right. It sounded like it. And, yeah. you know, it sounds like they 
turned into many therapy sessions, perhaps. But, um, but you know, you you were candid enough to say, you know, I know that this has not been always a smooth journey. So, um, but here's what you can, you, we can work on together. And I just right. think that that's that's um, really quite brilliant. Yeah, well, I'm you. going to. Um, I I know we have some chat uh, co comments in the chat, oh, and okay. we usually kind of break at about halfway through to uh, to see if there are people uh, that are joining us that. Uh, want to mine, uh, mine an area that we've talked about a little bit more or have some questions for you. So um, Jason and Makisha will kind of uh, check on the chat and uh, see. Uh, yeah, I, I saw the question about Faye saying sometimes we take things for granted. And that is, you know, it's not just true of, of our region, but oftentimes, you know, the, you're, you're used to what you have and uh, the grass is always greener somewhere else. It's got to be fabulous somewhere else. And um, sometimes it takes... Uh, you know, a person who's from somewhere else to say, mm -hmm. you know, this is really uh, there's there's a lot of a lot to love here. And I, I think uh, the region, which is a very diverse area that, you know, you've got small towns and big cities and rural and urban and farms and, um, you know, woods and, you know, a lot of environmental. We've got a, a beautiful national park. I mean, we're so diverse that um, we sometimes need to. Um, realize that we are pretty, pretty fortunate. Yeah. Um, so Makisha or Jason, do you have any questions here that um, we should mine a little bit further? Um, Jason wanted to men mention something you said, be open to trying, uh, trying something new um, that you're, you're, it sounds like you're very um, open-minded about trying, uh, trying new things and, and Either trying that or ignorant. I don't know what, uh, what it is. <laughs> I'm not really sure if I'm brave or ignorant. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I that's just always funny. was the, you know, if someone called up and said, I, and I'm also been, I've been a, a sucker for the underdog. I just I'll, always have been. Um, and if I think the organization is, is worth saving and worth, worth helping, um, uh, it, 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 it needs to happen. Um, I, if I didn't think it was worth it, I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't work on it. It's exhausting. I mean, it is, is, if I, you know, I think about the last five years and could I do it over again? I don't think I could. I think it was, it, it took a lot out of me. I'm, yeah. I'm happy with it. I'm terribly happy with the way th things turned out and, and had such a great board and musicians are fantastic and they're doing such a great job. And, and so is Carolyn. And, but to, to, you know, turn that ship around, it, it, right. It doesn't happen overnight. And I think that's another thing people need to understand. It's not going to happen in six months. It's not going to happen overnight. It's a slow and steady. It's got to be a slow and steady. Yeah, I think that sometimes people expect results fast. But in your case, using this as a case study, it didn't happen overnight. No. The, the the dysfunction or the lack of support or budget or conflict or leadership challenges. Um, it didn't happen overnight. And but we we're people of action. We like to solve the problem yesterday. So, um, you know, I think that that's that's a good coaching tip is to say, you know, it's going to be slow and steady wins the game, um, you know, to be consistent persistent, mm -hmm. insistent um, right. as you're as you're working your way through. Um, so you're at you're in your second or third retirement. I'm not quite sure. Um, what are <laughs> the third? I love that. <laughs> um, what are some of the the goals for this next chapter of your life? What what do you um, it, you, you sound like you um, have been very goal oriented throughout your career and maybe um, you're going to spend some time <laughs> stepping back and um, well, spending some time in in nature and enjoying what you've worked so hard for? Well, Sheila, what I found out about halfway through my career is that I tend to be a project person. I found out that I'm a project person uh, more so than a, just a maintain day to day day. So see, I, I looked at this orchestra as a project, obviously, you know, it had to be done. There need to be a finish. And then um, I had a situation with the Jefferson County Public Schools where I was asked to create two new magnet art schools. And so that was a project for me to do. I, I find that I'm a person that likes to have a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, and so I have a four year shelf life. Uh, I found that out about myself because uh, th to me, there is no such thing as a part time job. Mm -hmm. You can make a part time job into a full time job if you if you want to. And so that's kind of always been my, and I blame my parents for that. My siblings are the same way. Um, <laughs> and, and, we, and we all talk about it, how, how, how we all work too hard. But I, I just think that that's, that's really, really important. Um, the, so 
I'm going to keep up with the orchestra. I'm going to, I'm going to have some good time on my farm. Um, and I'm also helping out a couple of uh, other small budget orchestras that are sort of going through the same thing that um, LaPorte County went through a, a few years ago. So I'm trying to give them some, some advice um, as well. I love that. So we have a couple of questions. Um, Kevin Feldman has a question that I think is uh, a lot of us would probably love to hear your thoughts on. Okay. Music is trans music is transformational to those who make music. How do you see the symphony being used to help young people to serve as a healthy escape for their negative home life or poverty, as well as a doorway to opportunity? Beautiful question. Well, that's an easy question to answer. You know, music is the only international language. Now, regardless of what country you're from, if you get together in an orchestra musician, you can play a symphony by the end of the week. And you can have somebody from Japan or uh, America or uh, Venezuela or whatever, but music is the only international language there is. Um, music therapy has also been a very, very popular and proven point with patients um, to help them uh, with dementia patients, with Parkinson's patients, with um, they've been this study after study after study after study has proven that if you listen to music while you're studying Mozart, for instance, if you listen to Mozart while you're studying and programming for an exam, you're going to do better on that exam. Uh, students who tend to be in band or orchestra or chorus have higher GPAs than students who do not participate in band, orchestra, or chorus. That's a proven fact. I mean, you can do, like I said, study after study after study. Medical schools are now going after music school graduates because they found out their brains work the same, um, the way they can focus. Um, I, I think if you, one thing I've really enjoyed during this time is the education programs that the orchestra has. You know, we, we keep it very affordable for the kids. Um, we started these education programs 35 years ago at a dollar per kid, 35 years later, it's still a dollar per student. And most of the time the P PTA spends that anyway. We have people in our orchestra now um, that their first experience was coming to an education concert at the LaPorte County Symphony Orchestra. Wow. So that has made, I know it's made a difference in their lives. The orchestra has a student apprentice program where we have five students from high schools, three different high schools in the area that are full-time members of the orchestra. Um, and every student, we've had that for about three or four years now, and I'm trying to keep up with those students and what they're doing. Um, and so this past year, um, three of those students received complete full scholarships to colleges. Um, and, and one went into the Marine Band and then I can't remember. Oh, the other one's still a senior. He's, he's playing this year um, in, in the orchestra. But every one of these students will tell me being a part of the Port County Symphony Orchestra, because they played literature that was so much more difficult than they would have played in high school, that it upped their game as far as being able to their mm -hmm. talent. And so when they went to audition for colleges, they just blew people away because they already had this tremendous experience um, with the orchestra. So I'm a big believer that you start learning really young. Um, yeah. But you can you just keep, keep learning. So if they can take advantage of the, of the programs that the orchestra has and they keep stuff on their website, too, there's all sorts of stuff on the website that teachers can take um, advantage of uh, as well. And there's a big YouTube um, uh, part of the, or, uh, on the website where you can hear orchestra concerts that will be played in the past. So I can you tell you that there are, yeah. there are so many careers in music. It's not just performing. There's a gazillion careers in music um, that, that people can can aspire to if they want to. Well, I'm sure I'm not the only one that just learned a lot. I did not know about the music education piece and all of that. So that's really yeah. fascinating. Um, yeah. I, I see this in the, the comments, uh, love that the music is an international language. Most of us probably haven't thought of it that way, but that's really a, um, it's very a marvelous true. point. When, yeah, marvelous when I was point. in Louisville, our music director um, was invited to um, conduct an orchestra in Russia. And to do a recording session with with a with a Russian orchestra, he didn't know us. He didn't know a word of Russian. By the weekend, he had a full recording um, with that with that Russian orchestra because they were able to to communicate. Now he probably had a translator uh, for some things, but when it came to the music itself, um, they knew what he was saying or what he was trying to get across to them. So there's another one more question. Um, sure. 
uh, Becky asks, was your initial focus on corporate or individual and how was your messaging different or the same? So she's kind of talking about how did you do the turnaround in the culture building? So did you work on corporate uh, messaging, individual? Was it the same message? Was it different? Well, since the orchestra has subscribers, you know, you've already already have a built in um, possible donor base there with, with your subscribers. I will be honest with you and tell you that we worked more with individuals than we did with corporations. Um, not that we didn't. I mean, we try to pride ourselves on having sponsors for our, for our concerts. Sponsors are looking more to market there, you know, um, which I don't blame them. I mean, if they're going to be putting money toward a concert. They want their name on it. They want to, they want to make sure that we get so many seats to their employees and the individuals don't care as much about that. Individuals care more about just the support itself. And so we really worked on um, increasing the number of individuals that enjoyed the orchestra. And then once we were able to get them to enjoy the orchestra, to just very gently persuade them to maybe go up to a higher, you know, 100 to 250, 250 to 500, 500 to 1,000, that sort of thing. But I found that individuals give just because they care um, and they, they, they want to help. They want to see something really, really good in the orchestra. Uh, foundations do that too, obviously. I mean, foundations give because, um, well, number one, they've got to give away 5% of whatever they do, period. Right. Um, that's federal law, but um, they want to make sure they're doing something transformative for that orchestra. Corporations, uh, and rightly so, most of them want to be able to get some marketing out of that. And they, right. want, the, they want the public to know that they have a philanthropic bent to them. Right. Um, right. And that's to their, that's to their um, credit, um, I will tell you that as a consumer, I, if I was going to have to choose between one law firm or another law firm, I'm going to look at the one that supports the orchestra as yes. opposed to the one that doesn't support the orchestra or a bank that supports the orchestra that doesn't support the orchestra. Um, so, and I don't know how a lot of people feel about that. That's the way, the way I feel about it. But I, I will tell you from our fundraising campaign that we did the 1.8, um, almost... I would say 85% of that came from individuals. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. There's a lot of uh, comments in the chat about um, students and um, realizing that students uh, will step up if they're given a chance. So, yes. and again, that goes that goes to the, that corporate philosophy, uh, philanthropy or individual philanthropy. People want to help uh, young people find those opportunities. So that's a, a way that through orchestra support, they can um, they can you know help uh, young people. Yes, you know, one, one thing we started a few years ago was this instrument give back program called Drew's Gift. There's an organization called Drew's Gift of Music and where they take old instruments and refurbish them. And then they're loaned to students who cannot either afford to lease or purchase an instrument. That particular program has grown by leaps and bounds over the last four or five years. And so we want to be able to give students the chance to be able to play the tuba if he or she wants to or play the violin or um, and not have to worry about the $60 a month lease program or whatever right. that their parents can't afford. And pri previously, you can imagine how many students were probably shut out um, mm -hmm. of, of that situation. And I'm happy to report that that doesn't have to be the case anymore. Um, and we have a lot of our band and orchestra teachers that are taking advantage of this now when they That's know wonderful. they've got talented students. And so, so, so therefore, their programs have really, really increased in numbers as well. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I'm going to pass to Makisha. We unfortunately have run out of time and I want to be <laughs> I told respectful you I of everyone's lunch much. hour. No, this not was too great much. fun. You were so interesting. Uh, I learned a lot. I think some of our, our, I see some smiling faces. So I think some of our, our um, audience participants uh, learned and got jazzed listening to your message. So I'll pass to Makisha. Thank you, Tim. This was really Absolutely, great. Sheila. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take it from here. Thank you so, so much, Tim. I'm going to speak for the audience. Like Sheila said, I see a lot of smiling faces. This was phenomenal. I even see some hand claps here. Oh, uh, thank we you. learned so much. You are such um, a wonderful soul and such a wonderful yeah. addition to the Northwest thank Indiana you. community. So just thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. I was truly moved, honestly. Um, we want to thank our audience for coming out and for joining us today. Um, it's always a pleasure to see you all. So without further ado, we're going to let you guys have the next 15 to 13 minutes to gobble down some lunch before you go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you guys so much. Thank you again, Tim. Thank, thank you, you all so much. Bye, it was a pleasure. Bye, Tim. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye, everyone.